Good afternoon, everyone. We all know that we're here to uh, gain some words of wisdom from an incredible speaker and a very accomplished man. I'm not sure you're all familiar with exactly who it is that we're bringing before you, but think of this. When we have a couple of hundred young men who typically would be training at this time, and we suspend the training so an accomplished person can give you a message, then apparently the academy thinks that that message is very important. So let's share with you just a few comments about the messenger, Mr. Gary Cook. While I read or share his bio with you, you're going to hear me say at least three companies that are really, really internationally known. You'll hear me refer to the FA Cup, which is the equivalent of the MLS Cup, for those of you who are uh, into soccer. You'll hear me refer to Nike and Brand Jordan, which we're all familiar with that. And you'll also hear me refer to the Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC. So we're talking about a very accomplished person who has had a major role in those three companies, which, as I've mentioned, are internationally known. So Mr. Gary Cook, who is 50, has an impeccable track record of business success throughout his career. He joined Nike in 1996, rising to president and general manager of international brand Jordan in 2005. During his tenure at Nike, he held a wide range of management positions from overseeing the licensing of Nike team sports in the U.S. to leading the pan-European commercial strategy for Nike Apparel, EMEA. After 12 successful years with Nike, Mr. Cook became chief executive of Manchester City Football Club and led the organization during a period that saw tremendous achievements both on and off the pitch. The club won both the FA Cup and Barclays Premier League, its first league championship in 44 years. And Cook was responsible for executing a global media and market development strategy resulting in unprecedented growth. Mr. Cook was recently the chief global brand officer of Ultimate Fighting Championships based in Las Vegas, Nevada, responsible for all brand communications and creative direction, additionally leading international business development as the company continues to be the fastest growing company, company on the sports landscape. He joined the Ultimate Fighting Championship in September 2012 as the executive vice president and managing director for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. In this role, Mr. Cook is responsible or was responsible for business development and grand growth, excuse me, brand growth. The UFC ultimately was recently sold in the largest single corporate takeover transaction in the history of sport for $4.2 billion. And Mr. Cook was a part of making that transaction happen. So, gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome round of applause to receive Mr. Gary Cook. Wow. Do you ever, because I, I would imagine a lot of you are in the sports program, and this is quite a, this is quite a world-renowned institution in itself. Do you ever do something really special? and say to yourself, I can't believe I just did that. The introduction that's just been given, I really, truly can't believe I did all that. And I would hope that you would send that to my mother and make sure that she's well aware, because I don't think she knows either. The issue is, as I'm going to explain to you today, it's not necessarily about what we do, because that's documented. It's actually more about who we are 
and that's something I'm more proud of. What I'm going to hopefully do today, I'm not going to change your world. I'm certainly not going to make you either better athletes, better students. But I hope I will leave you today with some thought. That thought will hopefully provoke you to think differently. I've been blessed, as the introduction rather magnanimously said, been blessed to have had a wonderful business career in the career of sports. I love soccer. You can attest from the accent. I like basketball. Not very good at it. I'm certainly not a fighter. The common denominator between all three of those businesses that I was privileged to be a part of, they all were driven by the athlete. The athlete thinks differently, acts differently, and his goals surpass anybody else's. As the great Franklin Roosevelt once said, it's not the critic who counts, it's he that is covered in dust and dirt and doesn't give up and doesn't stop trying. But there are some keys from being good that might determine that you could be great. Bear with me. I'm going to test this. Does this work? Oh, good. That means I can walk around. I hate standing behind those things. They say that every picture tells a story. How many of you, I hope I see every hand, is a social media participant, a digital media participant? Remember, every picture tells a story. Every picture lasts forever. Let's share with you some of these. They may be difficult to see. Can you all see that? Can you all see some of those images? There's a picture of me with Conor McGregor. Anybody familiar with the UFC? Anybody know who Conor McGregor is? Okay. One of the greatest fighting athletes that we've seen in the last 20 years has taken the world by storm. Rather, um, rather an aggressive sport, I get it. But a true athlete who came from adversity to change the world, probably forever, in a different sport. Share with you some of his stories. Anybody know who Michael Jordan is? Didn't need a show of hands, probably. One of the greatest athletes of all time. I'll share some fun stories from Michael because they're behind the curtain stories. Up in the top left hand corner, anybody, any soccer guys in? Roberto Mancini, ring a bell? Owner of Manchester City, a guy called Khaldun Al Mubarak from Abu Dhabi, the sovereign wealth family, and down in the bottom left corner, His Highness. Sheikh Mansour, who owned Manchester City Football Club. Nelson Mandela is in there. We've all heard of Nelson Mandela, but down in the bottom right-hand corner, my favorite. Keep your, listen out for this story. Those three gentlemen manage the field at Manchester City. And out of all of those guys, they have a story too, and I'm going to share that with you. Let me talk to you about this one subject. Commitment is in the detail. Remember, my job today is not change your world, it's only to make you think differently. But I'll share with you what makes somebody else think differently that perhaps made an eye just a tiny bit of difference. Because sometimes if you make a little bit of difference multiple times, you become great, not just good. Cristiano Ronaldo. He actually played for the other team when I was at Manchester City, over the other side of the city. But I worked with him when I was at Nike. And he came to our campus in Beaverton, Oregon, an equally wonderful facility like the one you have here. We were testing a soccer ball at that time to take to market to become the Premier League soccer ball. Cristiano Ronaldo asked one question, and I was in the group when he asked the question that took him from being good to great. His question was, if I take a free kick with your soccer ball, how can you help me make a difference when that ball flies through the air? 
in order for, to make me the best free kick specialist in the world ever. Okay, big goal. Scientist who designed soccer balls had to think. The answer was, a soccer ball has one panel that if you kick it, the ball does not spin. Anybody know baseball? Anybody familiar with baseball? The knuckleball is a ball that doesn't spin. Cristiano Ronaldo had asked somebody, what's going to make a difference to take me from good to great? And the answer was, kick the valve. Hmm. If I kick the valve, the ball will not spin? Correct. Will the goalkeeper see it coming? Might do, might not. Will it always hit the goal? Might do, might not. The difference is, nobody will know what the ball is going to do. Better chance that you're going to score. If you go away and Google today, and you may do it tomorrow, or you may never do it, or if you're a fan of Cristiano Ronaldo, watch how he takes a free kick. He'll put the ball down, he'll make sure the valve is in the position he needs it to be in, and he takes a free kick, he takes three steps backwards, he takes one step to the left, and he practiced that a thousand times a week. And every time he tried it, he perfected the art. In his career, he scored 30% of his goals from that very action. And it started with the question, what will make me great instead of being good? That's a quick one. Conor McGregor, fighter. We've all established that. Just a quick one on him. When he lost his fight against Nate Diaz, he sat in front of his television for three days and he watched the fight over and over and over again. And I said to him, what are you going to learn from that? And he said, I'm going to learn more from watching my defeat than I'm ever going to learn from watching my success. And by a multiple of five times, I will study what I did wrong because that's the detail that will take me from being good to great. He seems to be doing pretty good, and he seems to be earning quite a lot of money doing being pretty good. But my favorite of all time was working with MJ, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan has a career that probably will never be surpassed. In the modern day, it's very difficult to pass by. LeBron James, yes, okay, doing a great job and getting closer. But at the end of the day, Michael Jordan was special. And he used to say, it's not the shot that you see me score that makes the difference. It's the thousand shots I take in the gym and the 250 free throws that I miss that really upset me. So I've got to be the very best that I can be because that will take me from being just a good player to being a great player. But that's one element of it, right? Because we don't always assume that we're just gifted athletes. MJ never assumed he was just a gifted athlete. He assumed he worked harder than everybody else. In doing that, he created a breakfast club. His breakfast club started at 5.30 a.m. with the Chicago Bulls, Scotty Pippen, a few of the others used to turn up, not everybody, five, six of them, 5.30 in the morning. And at 10 o'clock, the tomfoolery of Dennis Rodman would walk through the door because that's when the team practice starts. Dennis Rodman didn't want to practice at 5.30. He was far too good for that. But the greatest player in the world practiced at 5 o'clock. And he used to shoot 300 free throws between 5.30 and 6.30 because he said, that's when I'm going to get better in order to make me from good to great. But we always remember the elements when he would say, give me the ball and I'll win the game with 9 seconds, 10 seconds, 14 seconds to go. That's what we remember. But he remembers the work in the gym. Just an interesting thought. And my question to you is, if you walk away today with nothing else, ask yourself, have you discovered where the valve is? Do you overanalyze your defeats, not your, not your wins? And as importantly, do you have a breakfast club? Good to great. When you do that, Michael will say, that doesn't say on there, 
start practice at 5 o'clock in the morning before getting to practice at 10.30. That doesn't say on there, take a thousand free throw shots and miss 250, because nobody cares about that. What Michael cared about was being great. The outcome was his list of honors. Pretty impressive list. <clears throat> Switching to soccer. I had the great pleasure of meeting a gentleman by the name of Arsene Wenger. Is any Arsenal fans in the audience? Anybody like Arsenal Football Club? Don't be ashamed. Okay, Arsenal fan right there. Good for you. Great football club. But more importantly, one in the back row, more importantly, a great man. Been in his coaching role for the best part of 20 years, if not more. And I had the blessing of sitting down with him. Unfortunately, in the top right-hand corner, you may or may not know those two soccer players, there's another guy there, Nelson Mandela. I don't remember signing him, but apparently he was a South African president at one time. But the guy on the left-hand side, as we look at it, was a guy by the name of Emmanuel Adebayor. Quite possibly the worst athlete I could ever have signed. There was probably three or four others that beat him, but he was pretty bad. And he wasn't really that committed. But Arsenal didn't want him, and Arsene Wenger didn't need him. Should have told me something. But the first question that Arsene Wenger said to me, and I, I was, I was honoured when he said, wow, must be pretty cool working with Michael Jordan. And I said, <laughs> didn't expect that from you. Must be pretty cool working with all those athletes that I've been a fan of over the years. Dennis Burkamp, Patrick Vieira, some of the greatest players of all time. Thierry Henry. And he said, tell me more about Michael Jordan. And I said, tell me more about what you believe makes a great athlete, and I'll tell you whether that complies with what Michael believes. And he said, the very first thing that you have to have as an athlete is a natural ability, an abundance of natural ability, because if you don't even have that, you're really not going to get to stage one. And the pyramid at the very bottom, working upwards, says at the very bottom you have to have a natural ability. That's a gift, right? The Lord gives us that gift. Then it's what we do with that gift that becomes important. He said, though, that the second most important part is have you got the physical capability? Do you grow? Do you grow too big? Do you grow too wide? Do you, do you have the pace? Does the pace slow down? Does the pace speed up? Physical strength, mental strength, all of these things are important. But the physical capability, are you big and strong and fit? There are some kids that don't grow into great footballers. And there were some kids that were big and strong at 15, 16. But they didn't really carry it on because they were surpassed by their by their peers. You've got to have natural ability. The second stage, you've got to be physically strong enough to cope. And the third one, which I always thought was interesting, because soccer players in Europe, they generally leave school with a high school education, and it's, much it's, not, as, it's not as common for guys to go through a university program. They've never really been academically uh, you know, astute. And I'm trying to be fair and, and correct on this, but it's, it's only fair to say their language, their, their business is football or soccer. On that basis, they speak a different language. They have to know the language. Sometimes you can be a great athlete, but you might not have the awareness of the game, of the sport that you're in. And Arsene Wenger, the coach, believed that an athlete that's very, very important, and it narrows because people don't quite follow all the pathway, and they lose themselves by virtue of not having one of these components. But guess what the last one is? Can you handle the adversity? Can you handle five bad games in a row? Can you handle your personal life and your professional life. And the strength, the mental strength, is what makes the big difference. If you're Michael Jordan, if you're Tiger Woods, if you're Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, 
you've gone from good to great, and I will tell you firsthand, because having been around them a lot, they have a mental strength that nobody can compete with. Because the alternative is mental weakness. And I've seen players fall over at that point where they can't, they are weaker than their counterparts. Just a provoking thought on what makes good to great. Remember the pyramid? Remember that one of the greatest soccer coaches in the world looks for players and develops his talent pool by managing those key elements. Have you got all of those elements? But I think there's, there's really, you know, we can talk about attributes, we can talk about commitment and working hard and all of that. But I often wonder if there's an element in all of us that is respectful. Do we respect everything that's around us? Let me share a couple of hopefully fun stories for you. Michael Jordan in Paris is opening the Nike store on the Champs Elysees, which is one of the biggest shopping streets in the world. And Michael has to fight through a crowd of 10,000 people who have gathered on the Champs Elysees to have his photograph taken, very famously, the Wings photograph, he used to do that a lot, outside the Nike store, put his hand in some cement and walk away. The problem was that at 3.30 in the morning, we were just coming in. Not proud of that, I hasten to add, but we'd been into the Paris nightlife far too late, far too tired, and we had to be up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and at 7.30 we had to be on the Champs-Élysées to, to enable us to make everybody happy on a promise that Michael had made. And I said to Michael, we're tired, we're jet-lagged, we're not going to make this on time. I said, but I need you downstairs at 6.30 a.m. That gives you three hours of sleep. Greatest athlete in the world. My expectations were, it's going to be a real drill to get Michael out of bed in the morning just to make him appear. I went downstairs at 6.30 a.m. and there was Michael. I said, wow, you okay? He said, yeah, why? I said, I didn't expect to see you. He said, well, I've read the paper. I've had two cups of coffee. I've had breakfast. What have you been doing? And I said, well, I, I just thought we were going to be struggling to get you out. He said, why would I disrespect you? You work hard. You do what you do. You do it well. And you told me I have a job to do. All I've got to do is show up. Why would I disrespect you? And I've never forgotten that moment. And I'll never forget that moment. And what it taught me was to be respectful of everything around you. Not only respectful of those who are above us, but respectful of those around us, below us, and also respectful of everything that we have. I thought that was an interesting one. Has anybody ever heard of a guy called Mario Balotelli? Let me tell you about Mario Balotelli. I signed Mario Balotelli in uh, 2010. Mario Balotelli was Italian, the first black player to play for the Italian national team, and he suffered for that. But more importantly, Mario Balotelli was left to die in a gutter, stabbed 14 times by his parents, and abandoned in a street in Sicily. He was age three. He was rescued by the hospital, obviously by the services who put him in the hospital. Because he didn't have a mother and father, they'd abandoned him. He was basically adopted by the hospital, and four years later, he was adopted by a single white mother and her daughter, her only daughter. And he was taken into a family, and he was placed in a school, and he was the only black kid in this school in Sicily. And he was bullied and beaten up every day for five years. That's Mario Balotelli. And when he was 14, 15, he picked up a soccer ball and he started to play soccer and it was his outlet. It was the only thing he had. And because he became a great soccer player, people started to like him. 
And Roberto Mancini at, at Inter Milan loved him. So he signed him. And then he made him play first team soccer at the age of 16. All of a sudden, Mario Balotelli is going to be a world star. From such adversity, he lost it. And now he gained it all back. And we signed him. The downside of Mario Balotelli was he was a great soccer player with all the gifts and all the talent you could ever wish for. In fact, he was given more of a gift than anybody else. But when you put him in front of 60,000 people, he couldn't perform. Because he had to do the over extraordinary. We won the league, the Premier League, with one goal in the 95th minute of the very last game, scored by Kun Aguero. The ball came from Mario Balotelli, and it was the only simple thing he ever did in his entire life. He passed the ball seven yards. He'd never done it before, and he'll probably never do it again, because usually he wanted to score that over-extraordinary goal. But every player at Manchester City said he's the best player in the world on the training field. But when he's in front of 60,000 people, he can't play. That's Mario Balotelli. And he had no respect for anybody. None. Nobody. The police stopped him in his Bentley convertible, going 100 mile an hour. Pulled him over and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm nothing. Have you got anything in the car? No. Let's have a look in the glove compartment. Why have you got 20,000 pounds of cash in the glove compartment? Because I'm rich. Had no respect, no regard for anybody. Bonfire night or Guy Fawkes night is on November the 5th in England. You're supposed to have it outside your house. Mario had it indoors. Fireworks, rockets, cherry bomb, oh, all of it. Fire service, police. That's Mario Balotelli. He had no respect for anybody until this one day. He was late for training. Roberto Mancini called me. He said, where is he? He's got no respect for anybody. I said, let me find out. Mario, where are you? I'm there. I'm on my way. I had a call from a school, a high school. And what he'd done is he'd driven his car around the streets of Manchester, and he saw two kids. And they weren't at school. They were in school uniform, but they weren't at school. And so Mario said to the kids, what are you doing? And he said, we're not going to school. We don't want to go to school. And he said, why not? He said, because I get, we get bullied every day. He said, I got bullied every day for five years. I was the only black kid in the school. I used to get beaten up every day. Who are they? They're at school. Get in the car. Drove to the school. Mario Balotelli walked through the school with the kids. Walked into the classroom. The teacher stands there. What's going on? Mario Balotelli comes in, he goes, where's so-and-so and so-and-so? -and -so? Bring him here. Teacher said, I'm afraid you're going to have to leave the class. He goes, well, I want to speak to them. He goes over to him, he said, do this one thing. I was, prom I was beaten up and bullied, and these two kids aren't coming to school because of you. I've suffered that pain. I don't ever want that pain to be seen or believed by anybody else. Stop bullying them. I'll give you two free tickets to the next 10 Manchester City games. Promise me you'll never do it again. Those kids never bullied those kids again. Mario Baratelli had respect, but he had respect for his past and the pain that he'd had and the adversity that he'd gone through. And I thought that was an interesting part of his world that I wanted to share with you. Now then, my, two, my three groundmen, my ground staff, Manchester City, we were going to be the greatest football team in the world. We had three ground staff. They used to sit in their room with their lawnmowers and all of their equipment. And they used to sit there all dejected. They didn't really want to be there because they couldn't afford the paint for this and they couldn't afford the paint for that. And I respected the players and I respected the manager and I respected the owners. I respected everybody. But every week, the players had to play on some facilities that needed to be pretty good. So I thought, I'll go down and speak to the guys. And they were in their little cupboard, in their little place. And I said, come on, let's go off-site. Let's go and have a strategic planning meeting with three ground staff. 
And my question to them in respect was, what are you doing to make us one of the best football teams in the world? And they said, I'm not sure we understand. The best football players in the world are going to play on your surface. Is it the best in the world? No. Is it ranked in the top ten? No. Why not? Well, because nobody respects us. They just see us as grand staff. They put concerts on our football pitch every year because that's what stadiums do. They put Coldplay, Madonna on our surface. That's our surface. They just ignore it. They disrespect it. It takes us six weeks to repair it. Hmm. Will you have the best football pitch in the world if I stop all of that? promise you, we will. Two years later, those three gentlemen, in a black tie dinner, received the award as the number one soccer field in the world of soccer because we'd respected them, given them the opportunity, and they delivered for us. Now, maybe that's a teammate. Maybe that's the kit, the kit boy, the kit guy, the kit manager. Maybe it's the scorers. Maybe it's the physios. Maybe it's, they don't all have to be on the court. They don't all have to be on the pitch. But they're part of the program, and they're part of the respect that's required. I won't go into the, to the next one, which is facilities. You have probably some of the best facilities in the world of academia here at this school. You're world-renowned for your sports, and you have these wonderful facilities. Respect them, enjoy them, and remember these moments. Because when you look back, you'll probably look at each other and remember that you were all using those facilities together. It'll be an important moment. Anybody ever heard of Patrick Vieira? Yeah, there you go, my Arsenal fans up there. Right, lads, everything all right? I signed Patrick Vieira from Inter Milan. There's one key question or one key statement that you should always ask yourself. Are you doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Patrick Vieira came from Inter Milan. Sign, went to the ho hotel. Right, Patrick, let's get this signed up. You come from Inter Milan. You come to play for Manchester City. Everything's going to be fantastic. Right, oh, no problem. I'll go do my medical. Goes off, does his medical, goes to the hospital, runs a, a stress test on his ankles, on his knees, takes the blood test, does all of it. Fabulous get the documents all outlined. We're going to have Patrick Vieira. Get, let's get ready for the newspapers to take some photographs. This will be great. Chatting to his wife, Sherry. How are the kids? Everything's fabulous. Agent sits there. Great. Phone rings. It's the doctor. Hmm. He's failed his medical test. His knee has an interior cruciate ligament tear. He'll not play for at least 12 weeks. Roberto Mancini. Roberto, bit of a problem. Patrick Vieira, the legend of football, has won everything. Has got a tear in his knee. Hmm, don't need him. Send him back. Wow. Just send him back? Yep. Don't need him. Can't play, don't need him. Hmm. Into Milan. Uh, Marco Branca, we've got a problem. Uh, your footballer that you sent to us has got a knee tear. What do I do? <laughs> Not my problem. We don't need him. The greatest player in the world at the time, in his day, was not needed, disrespected. Nobody cared. And I thought to myself, that's not right. So I said to Patrick, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell Roberto that you'll be back in three weeks. You get yourself as fit as you can. But I could never allow you to be embarrassed by the fact that nobody wants you. You'll be great for us. So we signed him. And he shook my hand and he said, I'll never forget this moment. And I said, that's very kind of you, but I don't want to see that. I'm do I want to do the right thing. And he said, I appreciate that. He goes off two years later, he wins an FA Cup, he gets a Premier League winner's medal, he gets all of it. It's fantastic and he's played a massive part in our growth as a football club because we did the right thing and he was a great influence on everybody at the team, in the team. But at the end of his career, at 2011, he said to me, he said, I've, 
Roberto doesn't want me anymore. And he doesn't need my services. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, come over for a cup of tea. So we went round to his house. Now, what about this? How cool is this? Patrick Vieira has a dining room set. And every chair, and you could use basketball, hockey, MLB, all of us. Every team he's ever played for, he's had a chair made in leather of the team jersey. That's cool. Not many people have ever done that. He had an, AC, an Inter Milan shirt, a Juventus shirt, Man City, Arsenal, France, Khan. Fantastic. He sat down. He said, I said, what's the problem? He said, I'm going to leave, but I need your help. And I said, what is it? He said, well, I, I need my career's over. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I could go to New York. I could go to, I could go to Saudi Arabia. Or I could do whatever I want. He said, but I owe you. I said, really? He said, yeah, I owe you a favor. And I said, what's the favor? He said, you never allowed me to be embarrassed. You respected me, and I owe you a favor. The reason Patrick Vieira is still coaching and is now coaching and was an ambassador at New York, he's now at New York City FC, and he'll eventually become a coach at Manchester City FC, was because we did the right thing to another human being that we respected, and his loyalty and his passion was a repayment for that. Don't forget that. I never will. I'll take that with me, but I'll never forget it. I'm going to close this down here because you've got other things to do. And it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And as I said earlier, I'm not going to change your lives. I can only ask you to think differently. But I want, to think you, I want you to think about this one word. And the word is opportunity. Because there is one thing that I've dealt with over the last 30 years in sport, handling every single athlete. They all have an opportunity that only millions of us would dream of being able to have. But the common theme is that opportunity was not recognized, nor is it recognizable, because you don't see it. You have to create it. You have to make it. Michael Jordan didn't make his high school team. He was a bench warmer for his high school team. And if you'd have said to Michael Jordan, you're never going to be a, a world-class basketball player, he probably would have believed you because he couldn't get in the high school team. But in the last year of his high school, his senior year, he started to play a few games. And when he went to North Carolina and started off virtually as a redshirt player, he became one of those great players that had that moment when he scores a basket with nine seconds to go in the NCAA championship wearing Converse shoes, incidentally. And his dad said, your world will change forever from this day on. But that opportunity wasn't there for him. It wasn't gifted. It wasn't a silver plate. It was actually something he had to go create. Conor McGregor. Three years ago, Conor McGregor was a plumber. Plumbing. Household water pipes. That's what he did. And then he would go in the evening and he would train. And he believed that he could create an opportunity that it was better than working nine till five in construction. He had to believe that he could create it. There were three catalysts for change at Manchester City Football Club that I was proud to be a part of. They were Yaya Toure, David Villa, and Carlos Tevez. Not one of them wanted to come to Manchester City because, to be honest, we were rubbish. But they came because we sold them an opportunity, a chance to make the history at our football club, whereby at their football club that they were at, they were actually becoming less and less a part of the catalyst for development and growth. They created that. And I told you the Patrick Vieira story, who had finished. His life was over as a footballer, but he created an opportunity by sitting down and saying, I want to do something that you do. And I hope those resonate with you because you're about to begin all of these journeys. 
And it's going to be important for you to try and remember some of these things. You may not remember any of them. I hope you do. But I'm going to leave you with this one thought. Think about where you are right now. Think about where you are right now. Take a look at the person to your left and to your right right now. And in 10 years time, or even less or even more, you'll be sitting next to greatness in one way, shape, form or another. And you'll look at each other and you'll just know. You'll know about Montverde Academy. You'll remember that day, you'll remember that moment, you'll remember that goal, that basket, that, that class. You'll remember that moment. But more importantly than that, what I've shared with you today are opportunities that the greatest athletes in the world have experienced. But there were hundreds of millions more who tried and failed. And if you remember this one thought only, this is your moment. And there are millions and millions of people who would love to be in that seat right now. But good to great is in your hands. Have a great season. Have a great holiday. Thank you. Um, would you like me to? We did allow, uh, excuse me, a lot for uh, some time for a few questions from Mr. Cook and, and remember uh, a man of his stature who has a, a varied background and he's been around uh, very successful athletes across three different sports, at least that we know, three different spectrums. Uh, at this time, we'll uh, open the, open the, uh, Open it up for questions, so Mr. Cook. Should I grab this? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, perfect. Come on, fellas. There's got to be one from the Arsenal fans up the top end there. Uh, the United fans over here. Anybody got any question? No? Yawning. You were just yawning, right? <laughs> Anybody? Sure. Um, how did the UFC opportunity, for me personally, come about? That's a great question. Uh, because I'm not a fight fan, um, but the Abu Dhabi royal family um, are fans of the UFC. And the reason that they're fans of the UFC, the UFC is born in its entity around jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Is anybody familiar with Brazilian jiu-jitsu? It's a mixed martial art uh, that was founded, obviously, in Brazil. It's a derivative of judo, and it's part of the school curriculum in Abu Dhabi. So if you do PE, physical education in Abu Dhabi, you have to take Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And they were big fans of it. And they invested 20% uh, of the business. It was owned by the royal family of Abu Dhabi. And when I left Manchester City, they told me that they want to keep me in the family and go over and look after the UFC. So great question. But people often say that. What on earth are you doing in a fight business? But I will tell a story which is quite funny. Um, if you've ever seen a UFC event, on the Friday before the event, there's a weigh-in, and they have two fighters that come together, and they face off each other, right, like that. And somebody has to stand in the middle and make sure it doesn't really start the fight. Now, remembering that these guys are now cutting weight, and they're pretty angry. They've got no patience for anything. And I'd never done this before. And so on the first day, it was in Sweden, and I was holding court and holding the thing while they had the photographs taken. And lo and behold, Conor McGregor stands up. Another fighter, his name was, uh, I can't remember his name now, it was a German guy, stands up. And Conor McGregor wants to fight him. And I'm holding back Conor McGregor. Now, three weeks ago, I was at Manchester City looking after some of the greatest footballers in the world. Now I'm in the middle of a fight. So... You, you also have to take in, on board, I think, you know, you have to adapt to a situation. And I was really scared. I'll be very honest with you. I was very scared. I didn't like it. Didn't want to be around it. 
But um, yeah, so when, when that was out virally, my, all my pals were calling up saying, what on earth were you doing in the middle of a fight with Conor McGregor? So yeah, funny stories always come from that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Working for anybody or Manchester City. Um, biggest accomplishment and biggest failure. I'm going to hit you with my biggest accomplishment because my biggest failure has impacted my personal life probably forever, and I'll tell you why. My biggest accomplishment, I'm a soccer fan, our national stadium in England is Wembley Stadium, and I was sitting next to the Prime Minister when Yaya Toure scored the goal that won us the FA Cup. It was the first trophy we'd won in 47 years, and really what we'd done is we'd rebuilt a football team from nothing, and three years later we were on the world stage being watched by the world, and the player that I'd signed scored a goal. The team that I'd been a part of scored, won the trophy, the fans were crying. There were 50, 60-year-old gentlemen who had never seen any success at the football club, and I felt I'd helped to deliver and change people's lives. As shallow as that might seem, because it's only football, it's, there are more important things in life, but that was something that I felt. What's the biggest mistake? The biggest mistake is when you think that you are above it all and you make a single error and you are flippant either in an email, a social media comment, whatever it might be, when you think you're better than you are, you are vulnerable. And I made myself vulnerable in front of the world with an email that should never have been sent. It was mocking somebody else who had an affliction. It was broadcast around the world, and I will never ever forgive myself and never forget that moment. I'll live with it, and I'll take it to my grave, but it was a mistake. Can we re rebound from those mistakes? I hope that we can, because if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. But I'm glad you asked me that question, because that question always makes me remember that you can easily fall over very, very quickly. So holding yourself with integrity, honesty, being true to yourself is as important as being above. I hope that answered your question. I don't share that with many people because I'm not very proud of that moment, but hopefully you'll see the highs and the lows of being in the sports business or at least being a public figure. So thank you for asking the question, and I hope that answered it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Who is my favorite soccer player right now? Um, has to be Lionel Messi. Um, and I have a strong suspicion he might end up at Manchester City because he's out of contract next, in, next year, and they'll be talking to him. And the reason that, but I would say that in basketball it's the same and it's in all sports it's the same. If you've got the gift to change the game, and I know your coaches will all say the same stuff, if you've got the, the opportunity to change a game, Lionel Messi can change a game. Kobe Bryant could change a game. Michael Jordan could change a game. And so he has to be one of the greatest players of all time. So. At, but, it, but then you have to look at the generations because there were great players like Pelé, Eusebio, Cristiano Ronaldo currently, but I would have to say probably Lionel Messi. And by the way, I did try and sign him as well. <laughs> Sometimes they're too expensive. Even for the Abu Dhabi royal family. Anybody else? Sir? Um, I think if you look at our so question was, are the players naturally talented or do they just work harder? I think it's a mixture. I think you'll find Michael Jordan would say he wasn't naturally talented. He would say he works harder than everybody else. And if you looked at the Arsene Wenger model, he'll say it's a compendium of four different aspects. But to start the, to start the process, if you, want to win the, if you want to be Usain Bolt, you better be pretty quick at running first 
and then we'll develop the rest on from there. So I would say there has to be a natural ability. But the common denominator, I will say this, and, 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 and you've hit on a great point, the common denominator is the great ones work harder than everybody else. They stay back for extra training. They look for extra work. They look for the mental strength. They look to how to develop something that nobody else... Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, asked, how can I kick the ball differently that's going to make me the best free kick? So there's always that element of something different, but I think natural talent is where it begins. Anybody else? Anybody? Yep, one more. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What a great, that, yeah, great one. What possessed you to get into soccer and or into sports? Um, I was a soccer player, uh, and, I play, and I was a bad player, by the way. I wasn't very good. So I came to America to play. That's terrible. I shouldn't say that. But, <laughs> but at the time, um, in 1984, American soccer wasn't really world-renowned. It was, it, was, it was challenged. And I played for a team in Los Angeles, which was in the APSL and I played for 12 months for them. Um, and I got into sports uh, industry in equipment. And so I was working selling soccer uniforms and soccer shoes to retailers. And uh, I always used to say this one thing, and I, and, and I don't know if this is relevant, but I think it might well be. Nobody had ever told me that there was a sports industry. My mother told me there was an accountant, there was a lawyer, there was a doctor, and I thought I had to be one of them. Nobody told me there was this whole sports business. And then the great Arnold Palmer, the golfer, who we sadly lost, said, if you find a job that's a passion, you actually never have to work a day in your life. So I actually found sports, which I am passionate about. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go pursue a career in sports. And that, that's, that's how it happened. And then, again, as I said after the opening, I don't even believe that all of this happened. I just, it just, I just got there by default, really. I don't ever put myself into a situation where I think, oh, I really deserved that. Just happened to be in the right place at the right time and was passionate. So. But if somebody tells you you have to be an accountant, a doctor or a lawyer, tell them I said you don't have to be, all right? Anybody else? Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Before we dismiss this, just give one more big round of applause for Mr. Cook.